Sanhedrin. 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 Okay, let's go. You ready? We're on? We are on page 91, side 2. And we're going to continue our investigation of the resurrection. The Gemara now returns to its original discussion. The discussion that we opened last week's class about resurrection with, and that is, how do people return? Did they come the way they left? Beaten, bludgeoned, handicapped? Or did they come all shiny and new? This is the question. So the Gemara says, Rami, Rava Rami. Rava threw this at them. Now Rava Rami, the term Rami literally means ask the question. But it's like when you're having a discussion about something and, and how, what if I'll throw this at you, I'll throw that at you. And oftentimes Rami is indicative of a stira, of a contradiction. Now when you look at the verse, the verse seems to be contradicting itself. Which verse is Rava referring to? A pasuk in the 32nd chapter of the book of Deuteronomy, which is known as Shira Sazino, the song or poem of Hearken or Listen In. This is Moshe Rabbeinu's sing song farewell the, to the Jewish people. And there it is written, Ani Amis Vachaya. It says, I kill, God says, and I bring to life. And then after that it says, Machatzi, I strike, and then it says, Va'ani Erpo, and I heal. So what's the question? What's the contradiction? The contradiction, it seems, a subtle contradiction, is here when it says, Ani Omis, Va'achaya, I put to death, and then I bring back to life, that it sounds that the person that died is the person that is resuscitated. Same person. Exactly as you went, that's the way you come. If a person was missing a leg, God forbid, a hand was disfigured, they return exactly as they went. Conversely, in the very same Pasuk we hear, Machatzli, God says, I am the cause. In the end, it's all Hashem. You can blame all kinds of people. And they will be guilty for what they did, but still, it's all Hashem. Hashem says, Machatzi. <laughs> so I heal. So how does that work? Is he the healer? If he's the healer, then he brings home something which is he brings home something which is whole and healed. He says, Machatzi, I cause the injury, and then Erpa, and I'm going to heal it. So Rava saw a contradiction here. And he explained it like this. He said, Amar HaKadosh Baruch Hu, this is what God's saying to us. Ma shani meimis, ani mechaye. That which I put to death, I resuscitate, I bring back to life. However, it doesn't stay there. It's true that the person who died lives again. The same person that died, disfigured, beaten or broken, is the same person that rises. But after that person rises... Masha Machatsti, that which I caused the injury, Vanierpa. God says I will heal it. So therefore, it sounds on the surface like God is going to super strike a person down and then heal him. But previously it says he brings to life the same person he struck down. As Rashi says, the intimation is in the way the person dies that's how he comes back to life meaning when the person died blemished then he rises again and he is alive and he's blemished however and then the passage says when God resuscitates merape es hamachatz then he heals the breach. He heals whatever was wrong. And the person rises whole, so which will it be? Will the right resurrection rise? <laughs> which is it going to be? A broken or a whole resurrection? 
And the Gemara says, HaKadosh Baruch Hu first brings back to life, V'hoder ma'asho machatzti. Says Rashi, La'achar kein. After he's brought back to life, Misrape, then the healing comes. Ukhidiliel. This is as we discussed previously in the Gemara that we talked about in our previous class. Oimdin bimuman. They rise, they're resuscitated with their blemishes, umisrapin, and they experience healing. Now, since the Gemara had a discussion about this Pasuk, I make de- I bring death and I bring life. So the Gemara goes on and brings a Braisa, quotes a Braisa now, a teaching of our sages from the genre of the Mishnah, although it's not actually a Mishnah, we know that because it says, Tanura Bono Natanan. So Tanura Bono and our rabbis learned. In a Braise, the Pasuk says, Where are we? Tanara Bonanani Omus Vachayem. I bring death, says God, I bring life. Yochel, you might think that the proper understanding of this verse is, Shetehe Misa Be'echad, Vachayim Be'echad. There's a cycle of life. Somebody dies, somebody's born. God gave one person, took away his life, and somebody else, he gave life. Not that we subscribe to the Sanskrit idea of resurrection, that the person who died has now returned to somebody else's body. We totally reject that. Those who think that that's resurrection, that's reincarnation from a Jewish perspective, are absolutely ignorant of the Torah truth. You never lived before. You, you as you are now. And you're never living again. You get one kick at the can. You're connected to many other neshamas, like a, like a line is made up of many dots. But, but the person, the person that lived, you're a unique person. What do you think will happen? The Shia will come, there'll be ten bodies who want to get up. Each will claim the neshama. <laughs> Each will say, I'm the one who wants to be resurrected. It's not Rishkeit. So but we could say the same God. God gives life and God gives death. We talk about sometimes in a cycle of life, in a, sometimes in a family, you see there's a death in the family, a birth in the family. Ani omis, ani mechayim. I give life. I, uh, and the opposite, chas v'shol. So you might think that's the meaning, kederech sh'a elam noyeg, as the world goes, so to speak. Rashi says, misa be'echad v'chayim be'echad, v'hochi ka'oma, this is what you would say. Ani me mis adam zeh, I bring God said, bring death to this person. And at the same time, and bring life to another person. As the world goes round, this one dies, this one's born. So it is. So the Gemara says, not so. Talmud Leymar, the verse here, teaches me a very important lesson. It is stated, I strike, I bring injury, I heal, says God. Now, this we cannot take simply and as- ascribe it to different people. That's it. This one got injured and that one got healed. That makes no sense. <laughs> if one person got injured, why somebody somebody else get healed? The healing has to come where the injury is. So that clearly is talking about the same person, but this is the same verse. And just like the second part of the verse necessarily speaks about a person who is the same, so we say the same thing is true about the first part of the verse. The one who dies is the one who will come back to life. Ma mechitza or rufua, just like injury and healing, the echad have to be in one and the same. Af misa v'chayim b'echad. So it's true also with regard to death and life that comes together in the same person. Mikan, from here, says the Gemara, tshuva la'imrim, comes the answer for those who maintain and they foolishly say, the resurrection it's not biblical it's not in the Torah the rabbis made it up you know they borrowed from this mythology and that idea and this theology and they wanted to make sure that the Jewish people should stay with Judaism so they took all kinds of foreign ideas and injected into Judaism and it's all rabbinical mumbo jumbo that's mumbo jumbo it is in the Torah not everything has to be openly. The Torah doesn't have to state it clearly. The Torah alludes to things. If you study Torah properly, you will see that the resurrection is an inherent and integral part of verses in the Torah. Okay. So now we have more proofs from the Torah for the concept of the resurrection. So and we also understand a little bit about the resurrection. It has to come through a bryson. 
Does it have to come through a brisa? Where did you want it to come through the window? <laughs> Tell me, God wants us to put on tefillin. He had to write a teitofis and and and, and ois, uh, frontlets and signs. He couldn't just tell us, "Thou shalt put on black boxes with black straps." Must be make a reference. Right? There's a reference right here. Machatzti vani erpa, nameless vani mechaya. You want a more clear reference? I will bring to death, and I will bring back to life. But it's feeling that if you should put tefillin, it's br- it's brought in the brayz, or it's brought in the. In the <laughs> the, the pasuk that says over here, "Mamis ani mamis vani mechaya," it says it in a brayse. It's no, a pasuk. Yes, I know, but it's bringing, it's a pasuk. If you read the pasuk right, you understand ani mamis vani mechaya is necessarily speaking about the same person. Yeah. So that's very clear. It's open in the Torah. God says, "I put to death, I bring back to life." <laughs> what did you want more open? It's right there, actually. It's only that you have to. You need to look at the other pasuk in order to come yeah. to that conclusion. It's open. I bring to. I, I bring death. I bring life to the same person. It's very clear. All right, so now the Gemara has established we have this principle that Tchiyas HaMesim is from the Torah, and now we are going to continue to analyze fresh verses in which we will demonstrate that the concept of Tchiyas HaMesim is alluded to. And here it's only an illusion. You are right. Here it's an illusion. Previously it's open. Ani Memes. Ani Mechaya. That's open. This is just an illusion. Ton Rabbanon. The, uh, sorry, we did that Tanya. Tanya. Tanya, we learned in Abraise. Omer Rabbi Meir, Rabbi Meir said, From whence can I see that the resurrection, the resuscitation of the dead is alluded to in the Torah? And he says, Shanemar, because it's written in the Pasuk, this is a Pasuk that speaks about the post mortem, if you will or the reaction to the splitting of the Reed Sea in the moments after the Jewish people witnessed that amazing miracle. The Torah that records, Then Moshe Rabbeinu and the Jewish people sang this song of praise to the Almighty. And here the Gemara says, the Gemara says, you can analyze the verbiage employed by the Torah with great care. Oz shor shor lo It doesn't say they they sang. Shor is sang past tense. Oz is then. Then they sang. It says yashir. Yashir means they will sing. It doesn't say they sang. It says they will sing. Ha ha. Mikan. From here we can understand that Mesim, that the resurrection is minatayda. The same people who were singing there. Oz, then, not as then, past tense, but then, in the future, Yashir, Meish Rabbeinu and the Jewish people, they will sing again. And the obvious only way they can sing again is if they come back. So we have Tchiyas HaMesim in the The Gemara now goes on to say that there are a number of other verses like this. It says, Oz, Yivne, Yehoshua, Mizbeach Lashem. Then Yehoshua will build an altar for God. Now, if you want to be really exact, if you look at the Pasuk, it speaks about the victory that took place at the Battle of the Ai. And after the Battle of the Ai, the Torah talks about the Mizbeach, the altar that Yeshua built. But the truth is, if you look at Rashi and Radak, you'll find out that they say, Ein muktam that there is no necessary necessarily chronological order in the Torah's narrative and actually Yehoshua built it as soon as they came to Eretz Yisrael. Right when they came, he built an altar. It doesn't say Az Bana, it says Az Yivne. He will build. Ah, so what do we see from this? Bono Lenemar, it doesn't say built, it says Yivne. He will build. Says the Gemara, we come to the same conclusion. Lekan, from here we can see, Mikan, Letchiesa Mesa Minatera. So the Gemara now says, Really? Because it says Yivne instead of Bona means that he will build that this is going to be Tchiyas HaMesim. I will necessarily show you that can't be the case. Why can't it be the case? It says Az Yivne. It should have said Az Bona. So the Gemara says because there's another instance in the Tanakh, in the Nevi'im where it says Az Yivne. And this is talking about Shlomo HaMelech. And it's about building an altar. But not to God. Tragically, it's about building an altar to an idol. Oz Yivne Shleimah Bama. 
then Shleimu will build a high place and that Bama, the high place, the platform, is the terminology employed to describe such a location or, or a mechanism of worship that was used for an idol. And it says he will build it. L'chmoish, shikutz mayav. Chmoish was the deity of mayav. But when we speak of these idolatrous deities, we call them shikutz, which means abomination. The abomination of mayav was abominable that they worshipped an idol, a spirit, a shaman, a mountain, a tree, a star, a planet, whatever it was. They were worshipping Chmoish. So their deity, their idol, was called for us. When we looked at it as a shikutz, as abominable. So you're going to tell me now that Shleim HaMelech not only built an idol for, 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 for Avedah Zorah, Mashiach will come, will be the resurrection, Shleim HaMelech will be back, and Shleim HaMelech will be building idols, idols to, uh, altars for idols. It's, it's totally nonsensical. When Mashiach will come, nobody will sin. Nobody will do anything remotely wrong. The presence of Hashem will be so obvious. How is it possible to suggest that sin is going to be done after Mashiach comes? And this, of course, presents a challenge to the thesis that as Yivna Yeshua, then Yeshua will build. So the Gemara says, well, the thing is like this. Really, Shlomo Melech never built such an altar. He didn't build it. He thought of building it. He thought of trying to please his wives. It's a very complicated situation. It's complicated. Shlomo Melech didn't go and build an altar. He never did it and never worshipped an idol. Has Hashem. The Torah considers it as if he did because of who he was and the expectations God had of him. My law, love, of kilobana. It's as if we consider it as if he would have actually built an altar. But he didn't actually build an altar. The truth is there's a Gemara in Kedushan on page 39. The Gemara says over there that when a person has a machshava, has a thought for Avedah Zara, then HaKadosh Baruch Hu considers it as if that was done. So usually we say you get judged on your actions. I think Winston Churchill once said, I don't listen to people anymore, he said. I just watch their actions. Behavior doesn't lie. <laughs> so usually HaKadosh Baruch Hu doesn't judge us on what we thought of doing. He judges us on what we did. At least that's when bad things are the case. When it's a good thing, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is mitzarfa, machshava l'maysa. If a person wanted sincerely to do a good thing and he was prevented by extenuating circumstances, God does consider it as if. It's not the same as doing it, but as if he would have gone ahead and done it. But as a rule, that's not used in the negative. That's only used in the positive. But the Gemara says in Kedushin that when it comes to the concept of Avedu Zara, then HaKadosh Baruch Hu considers that the thought is as if you did it. Why would it be so? Why would Hashem take the biggest of all the sins, the sin which is tantamount to all sins together, and Hashem judges a person for what he planned to do? So there's a beautiful teaching of the Baal Shem Tev, where he said in the, in the Shema, we say, Vasartem vavadtem. You turned and you worshipped other gods. So the Baal Shem Tev said, there's a little bit of a distance, you know, but a person turned away from Hashem, he still didn't worship another god. He didn't listen to Hashem. Hashem said, don't eat that. He said, oh God, come on, look the other way, I'm going to eat it. He didn't worship an idol. He was just hungry. He ate a cheeseburger. He didn't worship an idol. So the Baal said, when a Yid turns his back on Hashem, that is idolatry. That is. Who is he worshiping himself? <laughs> he thinks I'm God. God is in control. I'm in control. God said don't steal. I said I need to steal. God said don't be mean. I feel like being mean. That is idolatry. Visartem is already vavadtem. So from that perspective, we understand that when a Yid thinks about building an altar to a foreign deity, when a Yid attributes and ascribes power and potency to, to nothing and says, that's God, that is building an altar. That is worshiping an idol. To the point that the Torah considers it as if it would have been done. And when Shlomo HaMelech entertained for a moment, paying homage, even lip service to an idol, Taylor comes along and says, Az Yivne. Because he didn't really build it. Because Az Bad. He can't say he built it. He didn't build it. It's Az Yivne. So therefore, the thesis remains, when Yeshua built an altar, it's still the idea that Mashiach will come, and then he will build the altar. He built it, and he'll build it again. Just like Moshe Ben sang a song, and he'll sing it again. And the fact that it says, in no way gets in the way of, of this, this um, thesis. So, I want, I want to share with you something very interesting. And the reason I want to share this with you is because there is an inherent question. Why is it that when it comes to Tchiyas HaMesim in Atayra, the Torah talked about Az Yasher Meisha. In other words, it was the song that was sung at the Reed Sea. And then it's this business of Yahushua, Yahushua building an altar. 
So why was that the vehicle to deliver the message? Why did Hashem say, it's going to happen? How do we know? Well, because look, they sang, they're going to sing again. Why here and through this medium did Hashem choose to convey this message? How is that even the message? Like it just says future tense. And from that we see that there's tchis and Because Because it's future tense. It didn't happen. Maybe it will happen in the future. But How could it happen in the future? They're gone. It's an asmachta, right? It's, a, it's, like, it's not a clear proof. It's just... Well, if, if you look earlier, it says, Mikan tshuva, what it says earlier, the Gemara we learned before, right? Ani, ani omis ani achaya. That's clear. That's, God says, I kill, I'm, I bring to life. Right. That's, that's clear. That's Mikan tshuva. Here it says, Mikan l'tchiyas ha-mesim. It doesn't say Mikan tshuva. It doesn't even mean an answer. But Mikan, you, here you can see that the concept exists. In other words, that there's a tro- Torah truism, there's going to be resuscitation. There's going to be resurrection. How do we know it? Where do we see it? The scripture is sprinkled with these ideas. If you keep looking at Torah, you'll see this being alluded to time and again. So it's alluded to here. In other words, this is not the proof. The tshuva is I, 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 I kill and I bring to life. That's the tshuva. That's the actual answer. But here is an example of where we see it. That this inherent truism follows through, it weaves its way through the tapestry of Torah. But still, the question could be asked, maybe here's not where we learn it from per se, but, but why did Hashem weave it through this particular tapestry? Why this particular Pasuk? So I want to share with you the words of Rashi on the Chumash. Rashi on the Chumash has the, the, the burden of explaining to us, what does it mean, Az, az Yashir? What Az? What's Az Yashir? What does it mean? So Rashi says that Az is a dynamic. It's a dynamic expression. It says Az at that moment, in the words of Rashi, Kishiro Hanais, when he saw the miracle, Allah believe Yasha. So when the miracle impelled him, in other words, this was an inspired song. It was not like, okay, let's schedule a spontaneous song. It was unscheduled. It was spontaneous. The Oz Yasha indicates spontaneity. They were, and it was due to inspiration. So this is a profusion of love for Hashem, awe for Hashem. This is B'nai Yisrael being moved by having this wonderful, deeply religious and spiritual experience. And then, and then Rashi brings another example for this. He says that that's the case as Yashir Moshe that Allah believed. And he says, V'chein az Yadabar Yeshua. And this is talking about Yeshua in the same time. This is the Melchama in, in Emek Ayolon. And this is actually on Gimel Tamas when the sun stands, stands still and doesn't set. And Yeshua is talking again. Yeshua is speaking to the people about a resurrection that's going to come. So he's speaking. So then it also says, Az Yadabar. Az Yadabar over there. So he says there's the same kind of thing going on over here. It was, it was a dynamic. It was, it was not a scheduled speech. It was a spontaneous expression. Yeshua began to speak to the people. He inspired. He rallied them. And he, he wasn't planning to give a sermon at that moment. And, and then he brings different examples. And he talks about the, the shira to, of, of, of uh, the Bnei Yisrael. And he says that these are the three examples um, by Yeshua, by, by Yisrael. The people saw something. They were moved. And spontaneously they broke into song or, or words of inspiration. Okay, Rashi, that's the that's Yashav Pshute. But really and truly, even if you have an answer, Liyashev Pshute, you could explain why the Torah would use unusual or unwieldy expression, the question could still be asked. There was an easier way to say that. So why did the Torah have to say it this way? And therefore Rashi does something unusual. Typically, they give us one answer. So what's the pshat? What's the meaning of these verses? This is the meaning of the verses. But when the Torah employs a methodology or a strange series of words, which it didn't have to use in that manner, but it chooses to use in that manner, so then we have to come to the conclusion that there's multiple messages. And the multiple messaging is contained. It has to fit in pshat. It has to be understood literally. But it also has a pun and a secondary message and other ideas that are being conveyed at the same time. So Rashi feels compelled to share with you additional messaging because just for this reason alone, for spontaneity's purposes alone, the Torah wouldn't have used the terminology as Yashir. So here Rashi says that there is a medrash and here he brings our Gemara. Mikan Remez, he says, at Chiyas HaMesim in the Not this is the Tshuva. Remez. This alludes. Not an Asmachta, but it's a Remez. This is an allusion to it. And he, then he says for two very unusual words, which most people in the Lern Rashi, they gloss over this. He says, V'chein B'kulam. V'chein B'kulam. That means the same thing is also alluded to by Yahushua. The same thing is also alluded to by Yisrael. Our Gemara doesn't say it. The Gemara here doesn't say you'll learn from Yahushua. The Gemara doesn't say he'll learn from Yisrael. The Gemara only brings down as Yashir Mesha. 
But Rashi says, just like Oz Yashir, is a remez of Chiesa Mesim and Atera, the Chain Bekulam. With Yoshua it will also be. And with Bnei Yisrael it will also be. So the question then becomes, first of all, Rashi came along and he added something which he didn't say before. Rashi just came and told us that the other additional allusions, additional hints to Tchiyas HaMesim, that the Gemara didn't even tell us. We have to use the methodology of the Gemara to come to that conclusion, but the Gemara didn't say it. But Rashi feels compelled to say it because he quoted these cases. He brought down, he invoked this, uh, the verbiage that's found in other verses as well. And because he invoked the verbiage found in other verses, so now he has to say that the same way I'm going to tell you that the reason that this was used, it has a pshat, it's for spontaneity's purposes, but it has also a secondary message, then in that case the same would have to be true by the other verses. It is true. The chen bekula. So the Rebbe says, so what's going on with that? Why indeed did HaKadosh Baruch Hu decide to convey this message then in multiple ways? V'chein bekulam, With Meisha, with Yeshua, and with Yisrael. The Rebbe said something amazing. He said with regard to Meisha, we have a Maimer Chazal, which is brought in the Gemara at Masech HaSaita and Daf Yud Gimel. It's also brought in the Zohar. In the Zohar, both the Zohar and the Gemara at Masech HaSaita use the same terminology. It says about Meisha Rabbeinu, Loi mes Moshe. Moshe didn't die. So it says. It says open. Moshe didn't die. What does it mean he didn't die? <laughs> the Torah speaks about a burial. He, who covered us? Atzma, he buried himself. But he died. When we talk about the caver of Moshe. The Torah says, Vayamas Moshe, Eved Hashem. Multiple times, Moshe's death is alluded to. What does it mean, Loi mes? Ah, so with this we have the explanation of our sages, of why and how a tzaddik's life is eternal. Right? Of course, culminating with the beer, beer of Chassidus and the Yigeres Chazayin of the Alter Rebbe and the beer on the Yigeres, which explains the meaning of the eternal life of a tzaddik. And the essence of the message is that the Chaim of a tzaddik is Chaim Ruchnim. It's a spiritual life. And the spiritual life, it doesn't dissipate. It's just clearly stated in the Zohar. It says that tzaddikim are found in all worlds and in this world, Yater Bechayuin. That tzaddikim are found in this world after the terrestrial passing, more so than during the terrestrial life. That's what the Zohar says. So, so with regard then to Moshe, in a certain sense, Moshe, Moshe never died. Moshe's body died, but Moshe didn't live, leave this world. Moshe is still here in this world. Moshe Rabbeinu never left. He's still alive. So because Moshe Rabbeinu is still alive, so what's the koyach for Tchiyas HaMesim? What's the koyach that, that, that all Yidin will come back to life? It's through Moshe. As Moshe continued to live in this world, Moshe Rabbeinu will be able to revitalize, to reactualize all the neshamas that left this world, bring them back to this world, and once they're all back in this world, from there, there will be a conduit. That'll be the segue into actual Tchiyas HaMesim. So in other words, Moshe Rabbeinu is, is an integral part of this process. Moshe Rabbeinu is, if you will, the, the logic of the process, the rhyme and reason of this, the, the system, is the concept of Moshe Lemes. So then, it's not enough to have Moshe Lemes. We have to have also Oz Yashi Yisrael. Why? Because you could say that, okay, Moshe Lemes, Mordechai Lemes, whatever, different Sadiqim, it says Lemes. What are regular people? Regular people is Mace. It's Mace. It says Mace. It's, 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 if, it wouldn't be, if it would be all Yidin, it wouldn't say about these few Sadiqim, Loi Mace. The fact that it says about certain Sadiqim, Loi Mace, so is a Raya, as a proof about other Yidin, it is a Yid of Mace. So one would think, that, uh, listen, Moshe Rabbeinu will come back to life. Aaron Akayim will come back to life. Which the Gemara, by the way, says openly. The Gemara says, we'll give them Truma. We'll give Aaron Truma. Moshe says, well, how will this all be? Moshe ve'aron imam. And the Zohar says that the Tchiyas HaMesim of Tzadikim will happen instantaneously. Even though the Zohar indicates that Tchiyas HaMesim of regular people will only be four decades later. So you would think, okay, Moshe, Aaron, Mardukhaya, the greatest of the great, the great prophets, the great Tzadikim, they'll come back to life. Everybody's come back to life. So therefore, he said, no, Az Yasha Yisrael. If we'd only say Az Yasha and Moshe, you would think only Moshe. Only the people who are next to Moshe. If it's Moshe, then, then uh, if Moshe is there. But ultimately, it is the concept of Az, Az, Az Yasha Yisrael. And the question is, who is the link to Moshe? Moshe was, says, Chatsi Adam, Chatsi Malach. Moshe Rabbein is like in a whole different realm. Who is the link? Who links us to Moshe? To Moshe Kibbutz Tehra Misinai. What's the answer? Misada, Li Yeshua.
his Talmud. It says that Moshe Rabbeinu, it says, the Gemara says, was like Pnei Chama, like the radiance of the sun, and Yeshua was like Pnei Levana, like the moon, which reflects the light of the sun, but of course not as intently, intensely. And so Yeshua, who's the Talmud of Moshe, and through Yeshua, the teachings of Moshe are promulgated to the Jewish people, like we say in Pirkei Ovis, uh, that we say the Moshe Kibbutzer Messina or Misarul Yeshua from Yeshua, then it goes on to Zekenim and Nevi'im until it comes to Anshik Nesak and this then is the order, so to speak, of how this unfolds. As Yashir Moshe, from here we can learn the Chaim Bekulam. We have the idea of Az Yashir Yisrael and the concept of Moshe. Now the interesting thing is that this, by, in a, in a, in a, in v- invariably, explains also why we bring the business of Yeshua as Yivne Yeshua Mizbeach. It's, it's, the Gemara wants to bring one singing it brings a different proof singing of Az Yashar Meshach the Gemara doesn't have to say the Pasuk of Az Yashar Yeshua you can understand that already Az Yudabim singing, singing, speaking the Gemara brings now action not only he'll sing again not only he'll speak again maybe you say Neshamas could sing too Az Yashar so the Neshamas will sing no Yivne you build with your hands that's an actual terrestrial thing a tangible thing Az Yivne Yeshua so this is one Nekuda. Another Nekuda, another, I think, very important point about the Az Yashir Moshe is a famous Medrash Rabba that says something very strange on the Pasuk, Vayuveyu B'nei Yisrael B'seich Hayam Vayabasha and it says, Vahamayim lem chayma miyaminim umismaylam The Jewish people came into the river, into the sea, pardon me, and there was waters of wall on the right and on the left. And the Medrash Rabba says, Hoysibas Yisrael Averes B'yam A young Jewish mother should be walking in through the sea. Ubna B'yadah her child is in her hand. What the babies do? What the babies do? They cry, exactly. What the mother mothers try to do? Try to calm the baby. So the mother says, the baby's in her hands. The mother takes, takes with her hand, reaches into the wall of water, and they tell us, takes, feeds him an apple, or a rimain, or a pomegranate. Right from the middle of the sea. She gave it to her child. That's the words of the Medrash. So what happened there? Obviously what happened is it says that, that, that trees grew from the ocean ground. <laughs> from, the, from the ocean trees grew. And the trees automatically produced fruit. Now everybody knows that for trees to grow from an ocean ground is quasi impossible. But then again, seas don't split open either. Okay, but even if suddenly it became fertile soil, it would take years. Until a seed germinates, until a tree grows, until a sapling comes, until a sapling grows up, until it starts to produce fruit. You're talking about years. How long could Kriyas Yamsev have been? An hour? An hour and 15 minutes? How long could the whole Kriyas Yamsev be? They went in at dawn. They were, by the time of sunrise, they were already singing. The Gansa Mai says an hour. So, so how did this all happen in an hour? And there was time for it to grow and for the, mother, for the baby to cry and the mother to pick it and, 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 qual- and mollify the baby. What's the pshat? And then we have the famous drasha of the Ran in Drasha Ches and the Drashas of the Sermons of the Ran was one of the greatest we shown him. The Ran f- coins the following phraseology. He says, Le'ovet kuchabricha nislim engana. God doesn't do miracles just like that. And he explains it that God cherishes nature and nature is in shadow for no reason. Nature is beloved by God and God wants to keep nature. And miracles don't just happen. Miracles happen when there's a need. So the Rebbe says, okay, what was the need for this miracle? You couldn't get by. Uh, find another way to make your kid happy. Yeah, yeah, it had to grow. Trees had to grow out of the ground, really. I understand the Jewish people had to be saved. The Egyptians were pursuing them. I get that. And if no trees would have grown, who would know the difference? So the Rebbe says that the way to understand this is looking at the Kriyas Yamsef not simply as an act of salvation, but rather the way Hasidus explains the messaging of Kriyas Yamsef, why did Hashem choose this way to save the Jewish people? The Kriyas Yamsef represents the concept of Gilu Yolikus, the concept of divine revelation. Like the Chazal tell us that Masharas, Shiv Chasalayam, the simplest Jew might have seen at the Reed Sea, Leiro Yechesko Ben Buzi, the prophet Ezekiel, who saw revelation that was said to be a reflection of nothing less than Matan Torah itself, he still didn't experience the height of perception that was reached by the simplest of Jews walking through the Reed Sea. So, in other words, it was not just an act of saving, it's an act of divine revelation. In the language, of, 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 of Primi Satayra, there's Alma de Skasya, there's the concealed world, there's Alma de Galia, there's the revealed or open world. And this spiritual concept is reflected on planet Earth, in which we have two thirds of the world is covered with ocean. Look at the ocean, what do you see? Do you see mountains? Do you see animals? Do you see teeming with life? No, all you see is ocean. All you see is waters. You don't see anything. You look on land, you see everything. 
you see, you see valleys, you see mountains, you see trees, you, you see life, you see animals. So the earth, land, represents Alma de Izgalia as a reflection of the spiritual truth of a revealed world. And then a higher spiritual world is called Alma de Iskasia, a concealed world, which is the, the metaphor is the concept of the ocean. What will happen when Mashiach comes? When Mashiach comes, Alma de Iskasia will become Izgalia. The world, that which is naturally concealed, will be revealed. This is what Mashiach is all about. Gilei Lekus. Everybody will know Hashem. That's why it says that the knowledge of Hashem will cover us, will, will saturate us like the waters cover the ocean. There's an allusion to Alma de Iskasia. The waters covering the ocean represent the concealed world. will be in that concealed world, but it will no longer be concealed to us. Everybody will see the presence of Hashem. In other words, the way the Alter Rebbe explains in the Kutu Teda, the whole concept of, of Kriyas Yamsov is the beginning of a process. A process that begins at Kriyas Yamsov with revelation, in which everything, the potential of everything is revealed. The potential of everything ultimately means the godly potential. And this reaches a major apex at Matan Teda. And that sets off a process. The process of Matan Teda only culminates, Merz Hashem, speedily and in our days, when Mashiach will finally come. So Kriyas Yamsov is actually the beginning of the coming of Mashiach, if you will. It's the idea of spiritual revelation. And because that's the beginning of spiritual revelation, it makes perfect sense that when they sang Az Yashir, that the song they sang then, that's the first song. That's the first shira. And that will lead us into the tenth shira, which will be sung once again by Mesha, Ubne Yisrael. So it all kind of comes together and makes sense. Okay, so now we understand why Mesha is here, we understand why Yeshua is here. And the Gemara goes on to bring now additional proofs for the concept of Tchiyas HaMesim from another very well-known Pasuk in the Torah. This is so well-known, we say it at least three times a day. Amr Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi, Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi taught. Where do I see the concept of Tchiyas HaMesim further alluded to in the Torah? And he says, Where? It's right there in the Pasuk. Shenemar, as it's written, Ashre Yeshve Vesecha. Fortunate are those who dwell or sit in your house. Oid, Yahalulukhasela. They will yet sing your praises. So, what does it say? It says, Oid, Yahalulukhasela. So, Gemara says, Yehalalucha, they will sing your praises. It shouldn't have said Yehalalucha. What should it have said? Hilalucha, sing your praises. Ashra yeshevisecha, eid hilalucha sela. Fortunate are those who dwell in your house. Those who dwell in your house, not only they get to dwell in your house, even more so, they get to praise you also. The truth is, sitting in Hashem's house is also something. Even if you didn't praise Hashem. Just a yid coming into shul is already something. It's Allah and Shulchan Aruch. When a yid comes into shul, he has to put a yarmulke on his head. To put a yarmulke, don't come be gilirash. Just being in the shul is already special. Sometimes people come to shul. I wonder what I, they accomplish. They come, they sleep. I don't know. Like Davin, say, they remind myself. You know, a yid in a shul is also something. It's also something. A yid sits in a shul. Who knows where? Who knows how it will express itself someday? A yid sat in a shul. Beings in a makom kaddish in a holy place. In the holy place, also something. Your father had a beautiful story. Came to the shul, sat in the shul, started to cry like a baby. He didn't daven, he didn't do anything. He was just sitting in the shul. He's sitting in the shul and it wakes up a yid's neshama. So we say, not only a yid has the privilege of sitting in a shul, but furthermore, you could even sing Hashem's praises. Not only you sit there, not only in that environment, you're even actively engaged and involved to sing Hashem's praises. Okay, very nice. But what's yahalulucha? Yahalulucha, why does it say he will sing? And, and Bishu Balevi answers, you know how? Then what this is telling us, Bishu Balevi says, Mikan, from here we can see, that Yid who sat in the shul, he will yet praise HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Not only praise Hashem, he'll praise Hashem when he returns. When Mashiach will come, and that's the concept then of Tchiyas HaMesim Min HaTayra. Now of course you could ask the question, okay, very nice, maybe it's referring to Yahalulucha in a spiritual sense. If you sat in shul in this world, you get to sit in shul in the other world. Maybe that's what it's saying. Maybe it's saying you will get to sing praises in some kind of futuristic, distant reality. So, so this is like a good question. <laughs> and at the end of the day, many of these psukim which say, it's not an absolute proof. We, we come, you'll see from the next proof, that kind of bolsters it. Here's the thing. If there would be only one reference like this in the Torah, it would be problematic. Who says? 
But when you have reference upon reference upon reference, you, there's a pattern that starts to emerge. There's a clear allusion to some phenomenon which is otherworldly that keeps getting alluded to. And you explain it one way, you explain it another way, but ultimately all of these different expressions in unison, they form an impossible to deny strain in the Torah, that there's a strain that's weaving its way straight through the tapestry of so many different scriptural verses, of so many different parts of the Torah, which are all saying ultimately the same thing. What was will be again this dead of Tchis and Mesa. The Gemara now further says, V'amad Rabbi Shua ben Levi, Rabbi Shua ben Levi said, Kol ha'aymer shiro ba'ilam hazeh. Anybody who actually sang Hashem's praises in this world, Zeicheh ve'aymra lo'ilam haba. He will sing it in the future again. Shanemer, as it says, Ashle yeshe ve'secha, Oyj ha'aluluch ha'sela. Fortunate are those who sang your praises. They will yet sing your praises again. So the Masha explains this by saying, that the idea of Oija Halucha is, 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 so to speak, to say that as long as a Yid once sang Hashem's praises, that he will sing Hashem's praises. Here it's not necessarily referring to Tchiyas Mason. Here it's a different teaching. Here Taka could be referring to the heavenly reality. Here it could be referring. What, what's it, what does a Yid do in Gan Eden? Whatever he did on earth. If you're saying he davened here, you'll daven there. <laughs> he didn't daven here. It's big chalice. How are you going to daven there? You have to have done something here. The Ganadin that we that that, that a neshama lives in is the is the is the is the composite of what the neshama engaged in when it was here. What it does here, that's what it does. It gets to do there. So that's how the Masha explains it, and and uh, uh, there's a discussion in the Farshim whether this, this might also allude to Chiyas as well. The Gemara now says, "Amr Rabbi Chiyah Barab, Rabbi Chiyah Barab taught, Amr Rabbi Yechonah and Rabbi Yechonah taught." From whence do I know the concept of Tchiyas HaMesim from the Torah? And he says, because we have a Pasuk. This verse is found in the prophecies of Yeshayahu Hanavi. Chapter 52, verse 8, the, the verse reads as follows. Koil tzoifayich nosu koil. The voice of tzoifayich have raised their voices, yachtav together. Yiranenu, they will sing. So the Gemara says... This is the voice of your tzoyfayich. We'll speak of what that means in a moment. It should have said They sang in unison in concert. Why does it say they will sing in concert? It doesn't say rininu. Instead it says yiranenu. Since it doesn't say rininu, they will sing. Since it says yiranenu, it doesn't say they sang. It says, Yiran and who they will. From here we can see, So let me just take a moment to share with you. What is Tzoyfayich? So the word Tzoyfe comes from the terminology of uh, seeing. To look. To look into the distance, look into the future. To, to, you can look into many things. So you can just ask somebody, I'll look into that. Is it a good investment? Is it a good idea? I'll look into it. Is, is, is it a good strategy? I'll look into it. You're not looking in the same way. A person could look. Some people could see the future. They're called prophets. Some people can't see the future. But they have a vantage point that allows them to see what others can't. Why? They're a strategist. They've been analyzing the market for 50 years. They have a certain bird's eye view. They see things differently than other people. And yet, other people, they are not have any special experience. But they're in a special place. Like? Like a lookout. <laughs> they're in a lookout. So if they're in a lookout, they see what other people don't see. So actually, this Indian of Tzoyfe, if you look in the Mepharshim, so the Mepharshim seem to say that the concept, Rashi says, Tzoyfim Shema Amidim Alachaymas. These are the people with the telescopes, the people on the high walls. They're looking at the, seeing where the enemy's coming from. That's what it means. The ones in the Migdalim, the ones in the towers. Lirais Ulavasa, to see and then to convey, Mi Bala'ir, who's coming. Friend or foe. And if you look in the Mitzudah's David, he says the same thing. Those, this is the lookout, the sentries were up on the high lookout towers. Okay. But the Radak takes a different approach. He says, He says, He follows the Gemara in, in here, Mesech Sanhedrin. He says, It means, Your prophets. They're not looking at the next field or at the next valley. They're looking into the future. Ki Hanovi says Radak Yikarit Seifa. The Novi is called a seer. You can see. Ki Mait Seifa Nasatichal Beis Yisrael is a question. Is a direct quote from the prophecies of Ezekiel. 
Why is he called a viewer, a seer? Because Shutzoife, he sees Asidus. And, and then he goes and he tells you what he saw. So our Gemara seems to follow the notion of prophets. That's, that's the way our Gemara, our Gemara is not talking about the centuries, but the Gemara is talking about the prophets. And what the Gemara says, according to Abiyechanan, is that these Tsoifim, these ones who are able to view the future, there will come a time when they will raise their voices. They'll raise their voices, Yachtov. And what will they do? Yiravenu. They will sing. They'll sing Hashem's praises. It says, From here we can see, Why? How can we see that from the Yiranenu? So the Pshat is like this. Pshat is that the Nevi'im, on a very literal level, lived in different times. Every Navi had its time. Every Navi has its Nevuas. But there will come a time, Mashiach will come. Imagine the image. All the great Sadiqim, all the ages. And they're all singing together. <laughs> Imagine what a concert that's going to be. Imagine a choir. See, all the Nevi'im together. Usually you say, a Navi Bira, you know. He's in his own city. Nobody even appreciates him. When he goes a guest speaker somewhere, oh, the Navi's here. It's a big deal. But one Navi in a generation. But as every generation is, gets, gets what it gets. Yiftach b'dayre, kishmol b'dayre. Yiftach in his generation is a lowly fellow, was nothing special. In his generation, he was just as good as Shmuel in his generation. Shmuel, about whom it says, was like Moshe and Aaron together. Shmuel, uh, Shmuel was like a Moshe of Aaron b'chayr, not a Shmuel b'chayr ishmay. Moshe v'aaron, and Shmuel in some ways equal to Moshe v'aaron. <laughs> and this guy, this Yiftach, is equal to Shmuel of, of, of his generation. And then the Gemara says something, Shocking. The Gemara says, the Shmuel Bedere Shal Yiftach had Shmuel the great prophet, who in some ways is likened to Mesha and Aaron. Had he been in the generation of Yiftach, Lahoya Nechshav Leklum, he wouldn't even get a minion. Nobody will listen to him. Nobody will listen to Shmuel Anavi. Shmuel Anavi, Mesha be Aaron Bechayanav, Shmuel Bechayanav, Shmuel And Yiftach will be giving a sermon to listen to Yiftach, will listen to Shmuel. How could such a thing be? The answer is every generation gets the leader it deserves. Yiftach knew how to talk the language. These were, these were coarse, crass people. Yiftach knew how to give them a zetz in the head. He knew how to speak to these people. He knew how to use the lingo and the slang. And they responded to him. And the Shmuel was speaking this uh, holy verbiage that he was talking about. Nobody related to him. So you have different generations and different voices and different tzaddikim and different prophets. And Hashem put each one, the one that it needed, the generation that needed a Yiftach, they got a Yiftach. The generation that a Shmuel got a Shmuel. So, so how, could, how could they all sing together in the same voice? The whole virtue is that they are different. The whole point is that every generation is different. That because different generations have different prophets and different leaders, they're all going to sing in different voices, so to speak. They're all singing Hashem's praises. It's all a song. The whole, the whole, all the Torah is a song. Life is a song. It's all a song. But it's different songs. But the, this is what the Gemara is telling us. The Gemara is telling us there will come a time when there will be this mass equality. Mashiach will come, we'll all be on the same level. The generation, the generational gaps, the generational differences will fade away. And the tzoifim, the greatest expression, the Navi who represents the whole generation in a concentrated form, all these Nevi'im will come and they'll sing together. The Ben Yehuda says that we know some Nevi'im spoke a message that was positive and some Nevi'im spoke a message that was negative. Not that Yirmiyahu wanted to give negative prophecies. He didn't want to give it. Kodesh Baruch Hu says, not your choice. I knew you before you knew yourself. And you have to go give these prophecies. <laughs> and Yirmiyo says, why do, why do I have to give? How does this end up being my problem? And Yeshayo has rosy, glowing prophecies. And y- Yirmiyo is called the Navi of, 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 Chur, of, of Churban. And Yeshayo is called the Navi of Gula. Not, not because Yeshayo is chas v'shon, better than Yirmiyo. Who are we to, to compare prophets? They had different messages. The Abishta wanted to give a, a harsh message to the Jewish people. He wanted to give a bright message to Jewish people. Different times needed different messages. How would they sing in the same voice? It's, a, it's like saying a, a, a sad melancholy song and a triumphant jubilant song and it's the same song. How could that be? So the Pasuk actually doesn't seem to make any sense. And maybe that's why Rashi and Mitzudah Siyan who emphasize very strongly Pshat, they go away from this. They, they don't talk about Nevi'im because on a literal level doesn't... Kol Tzafayich, Nosa Kol Yachtov. Why it says the end of the pasuk, by the way, is ki ayin ba'ayin yiru b'shuv Hashem tzian. This is talking about Mashiach comes. So, on a literal level, they'll all see the same thing. All the political analysts who predict the different things, all the people who are up there in their little watchtowers and vantage points who see different things unfolding. When Mashiach will come. Everybody will see the same picture. 
everybody will start seeing the same thing. The pessimists, the optimists, everybody will see the same picture unfolding. Only when Mashiach will come. But the deeper message is that Kurt Seifayich, all of those who saw the future from the past, and they saw it very different ways. Yirmiyo's future, the one he was shown by Hashem, what he saw, what he had to speak about, very different than what Yeshayo had to speak about. And yet, when Mashiach will come, Nosu Kel Yachtav, they'll raise their voices in unison. They'll be in perfect harmony. They'll be singing the same song. Yerananu. Why? How could that be? Ki ayin ba'ayin yiru. Because they'll see God in a very real way. Because we'll all see Hashem, so to speak, eye to eye. Beshuv Hashem tziyin. So the Ben Yadah says, Ah, so the prophets will all be speaking in the same voice. The Navi of Paronius and the Navi of Geula. The Navi who spoke about negativity and the Navi who spoke about positivity. All speaking the same. This could only be when Mashiach will come. And anyway, if we speak about Nevi'im, speaking in different voices, the different voices were because they lived in different times, for the most part. If they lived in different times, they couldn't have been speaking at the same time. They couldn't have been speaking together. And yet, the Torah says that the Emer Hashem will be Yachtav Yirananu. Together they will. Not Rinanu, but Yirananu. They will sing. And from this we can see the concept of Chiyas HaMesim Min HaTorah. And with this we, dis- we conclude for now, the discussion on the resurrection, and the Gemara goes now in a new direction, speaking about other interesting things, and we'll come back to this concept, the Gemara will later, we'll come back to this concept, as they say in the Golden Oldies, to be continued. Why does it say about the, uh, the, pasuk, the pasuk of Yaakov said to Esav, meet me on Mount Seir? Patience. He's going, to, he's going to talk about it? The Gemara talks about a lot of things. I think later on in the Gemara, yeah. <laughs> I should have learned this Gemara in a while, you know, like I'm all full from memory right now. <laughs>